can have a seat. Take your Bibles out. Hey, as you're sitting down and kind of getting settled, can, can, we, can we do one more thing? Can we just give God praise one more time this morning? I know that's kind of the heartbeat, and I know we're not done, but uh, wow, what a powerful, what powerful testimonies there. We've heard a message on tithing. We've heard a message on legacy, um, just, just all in what... Um, all in what God's done in and through these folks. And we didn't plan that, Josh. Josh, you mentioned, Lord, I need you and your testimony. And we didn't even plan that that was going to be that song right there. That's almost like someone's in charge. Um, and so I want to turn your attention again to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to go as, as, kind of as quickly as we can through this, but I do believe there's some things that God wants us to see today as we're celebrating, and just maybe a reminder of who and whose we are and what we're doing here. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and, and just so you know, the way the, the letter to the church at Ephesus is made up, the first three chapters are really all about theology. It's really, it's really the, the, the gospel that Paul just, and that's why the book of Ephesians is so rich. If you talk to many, many, many um, pastors and church leaders and Christians and seasoned uh, folks in, in the church, they love the book of Ephesians because it's so rich because the first three chapters are really turned to theology of the gospel. And then uh, chapters four, five, and six are Christian living. Um, and, and just how to live and how to, how to press into Jesus. And we've got the armor of God in there. And uh, it's, just, it's just such a solid book, such a solid letter from Paul to the church at Ephesus. And so Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11, Therefore, and, and real quick, real quick, a little bit of Bible teaching for you, if we can go into school for just a second. Whenever you see the therefore in Scripture, you've got to ask what the therefore is there for. Okay, I don't know if you've ever heard me say that, but that's huge when you think about context, that whenever you see therefore in Scripture, you've got to ask what the therefore is there for. And so let's back up just a second, just for fun, because we've got all the time in the world, that, for, that what Paul writes right in front of this is, for by grace you have been saved, verse 8, through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in them. Now we could spend days on that text right there, just verses 8, 9, and 10. But therefore, because you have been saved by grace through faith in Christ, remember, back to verse 11, that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope. Look at your neighbor and say, no hope. Having no hope. This is huge for us, church. Having no hope. Breeze, you can calm down just a little bit. Okay, come on now. Need another weight. All right, there we go. Having no hope and without God in the world. And so again, saved by grace through faith, therefore, and Paul's reminding them. Paul's reminding them. Don't you love at family gatherings when you show up and people remind you of who you were before? Anybody? I mean, anybody just love that time at Thanksgiving? Just love the moments where... People say, oh, remember 30 years ago when you were dumb and you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that and you made that decision? That was the re most ridiculous decision of, in the planet, right? We got a new puppy yesterday. We're in that boat, okay? You can look at us 30 years from now and be like, you remember Capital Campaign Commitment Weekend Celebration Sunday when you got a new puppy and you were up, well, Kristen was up all night the night before Celebration Sunday and you remember that? That was so stupid. We're there, okay? You can do that, all right? The puppy's eight weeks old. If anybody wants to keep him for a couple months and get him all trained and sleeping through the night, and that's what we did with our kids. No, I'm just kidding. We didn't do that. Okay. But what he's doing is he's reminding them, okay, therefore, you've been saved by grace through faith, right? But remember, remember, and what's he reminding them of? The fact that they were two things. Number one, separated, okay? They were separated from God. He's reminding them of the separation 
that they had from God right? Why is he reminding them of that? Because that's the gospel. That's the beauty of the gospel. And we're going to get to it in just a little bit more because Paul goes into it, but I just want to give it to you now because we've got to remember that we were separated, that Jesus came so that we might have access to the Father. As he prays in John 17, we talk about this all the time, he prays that the church, that us, we were on the mind of Christ on the way to the cross, would be one as he and the Father are one. Jesus came to create access. And so Paul's reminding the church at Ephesus that they were separated. Secondly, he's reminding them by the circumcised uncircumcised deal. He's reminding them, we're not going to dive into that, okay, because Emily took way more than 90 seconds, okay? We're not going to dive into that, right? But the second thing he's reminding them of is not only are they separated from God, not only were they separated from the gospel, but they're divided. They were divided. Jew, Gentile, they were divided, and so he's reminding them of their, reali- of their reality before Christ, before they, and before they were saved by grace through faith, that they were separated and divided. And he even goes as far as to say there at the end of verse 12, and I would underline this, I would star this, because this is everyone's reality before Jesus. This is everyone's reality before Christ. Before Christ. And it could even be, I mean, I mean, through the last eight months, we've, we've had so many people tune in online right now. Some people are watching online right now from all over. And it could be the reality of some of us sitting here right now. Some of us watching on a screen right now or listening in the car right now. But, <laughs> but, but underline this, star this, having no hope and without God. That was our reality. Without Jesus, that's the reality. Having no hope. Having no hope. And without God in the world. All right, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. Verse 13. Again, just keep underlined, star again. But now. Look at your neighbor and say, but now. But now, some of my favorite passages in Scripture, some of my favorite lines in Scripture, Dylan, are when in the Old Testament we see, but God. But God. Right? And here in in Ephesians, we see Paul doing a but God. Right? But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, divided, separated, no access, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now look. We can, we can celebrate, we can celebrate, we're going to celebrate, we can celebrate all we want to, but if we're not celebrating Jesus, we're missing the point. If, if, if there's not glory being given to God, we're missing the point. Every person that spoke up here, everything we're going to share from this point on, the reason we're doing communion today is because we've got to remind ourselves constantly. I don't know about you, I need the constant reminder that everything I do, everything the summit does or is done to and through summit is because of Christ, not me. It's because of Christ, not Ian. It's because of Christ, not our leadership. It's because of Christ and still not Dan Garish. As awesome as Dan is. But now, but now in Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And Jesus brings some things with him. He, he promises some things with him. There's some promises that we can claim because of the blood of Christ that we're reading about here. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. But Jesus, we have peace. In Christ there's peace. I love, uh, I, I know I've told this and told this and told this, but some of us may need to be reminded of this today. Chris Turner came up to me, I think like in 2012, 2013, and she said, peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of Jesus Christ. We see that here. Peace is not the absence of, a, of, a, of, of trouble. It's not a full bank account. It's not a, you know, job security. It's not any of that. It's the presence of Jesus. If we don't have the presence of Jesus in our lives, guess what? No peace. No peace. We look at what else Jesus brings along. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh 
the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the, cro- through the cross, thereby killing the, hus- the hostility. Woo! Is that a timely verse or what? That in Christ, not only does he bring peace, he brings unity. Killing, killing, literally putting to death hostility that they once had and were justified in, and were justified in because Jew and Gentile, they didn't mix in this time. The circumcision, uncircumcision, they didn't mix in this time. They were justified in their separation, their division. Jesus came and killed the hostility by his blood. Now, now, if we don't get more excited about that than anything else that's going on in our lives right now, then, then we need to check ourselves because that right there is exciting. That's a reason to celebrate, church. Jesus came and killed the hostility between them that, again, was justified at the time. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. So he brought reconciliation in unity. He brought forgiveness in unity. He brought forgiveness. A lot more I want to say there, but I got to keep going. I got to keep going. Verse 18, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. There's the hope. There's the hope. If you've got the wide margins, if you've got a place in your Bible to write something that in verse 18, in verse 18, verse 18 is a verse of hope. For through him, the him being Jesus, we have both access in one spirit to the Father. We have hope. Why? Because we have access to the Father. Why? Because of Jesus. Verse 19, it keeps going. Here's the promise. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Members of the household of God. That's huge. That's huge. Because we all have two basic needs, right? We all have two basic needs. The need to be loved and the need to belong. A need to be loved and a need to belong. Need to belong. Not a need to be long-winded. A need to be loved and a need to be a need to belong. And that's the beauty of the church of Jesus Christ. That here, here, there should be both. A place where you're loved, a place where you belong. A place where you're loved, a place where you belong. And that and that's let's keep going. Let's keep going. Verse twenty built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Right? Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. We looked at it yesterday in Psalm 127. Unless God builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Jesus himself being the cornerstone of the church. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Now what's Paul talking about here? He's not talking about the structure of the church building. He's not talking about the structure of the church building. He's talking about the fact that in the New Testament, in the New Testament, because the Old Testament, we've looked at it, right? There's tabernacles, there's temples that are built for the dwelling of God, right? And there were all types of ceremonies that they had to go to to get, and there, there were restrictions on how close people could get um, to the presence of God and all of, the, all of these different things. And then Jesus came, right? All of that goes away. We have unlimited access to him. Why? Because the Spirit's dwelling in us. And so when Paul talks about the whole structure being joined together, grows into the holy temple in the Lord, guess what he's talking about? Us. Us. 
He's talking about you. He's talking about your personality. He's talking about your preferences. He's talking about your music taste. He's talking, we all come together, joined together into the holy temple of God. It's the beauty of the gospel. It's the beauty of the God. Louis just said amen. It's the beauty of the gospel. It's the beauty of the gospel. And then verse 23. In Him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So, our foundation is Jesus being the cornerstone of the church. And He is building His church. Us. Everybody say us. Us. That's me. That's me. I, like, I don't know about you, but I get overwhelmed when I think about John 17, the fact that he prayed for Summit Church on his way to the cross. That we would be one as he and the Father are one. That, he, that I was on the mind of Christ on the way to the cross. You were on the mind of Christ on the way to the cross. Being the cornerstone. So that, so that, and here's the deal. Here's kind of our crux. Here's kind of our challenge. So that we can be hope sharers. So that we can be hope sharers. So that this message of hope, this access to God that Paul tells the church at Ephesus, hey, you're, you're being joined together. Why? So that you can be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that you can accomplish the mission of God here on earth. Why? So that we can advance the kingdom of Jesus. Why? So that God can be glorified. So that God can be glorified. And so today, in all things, in our singing, in our welcoming, in our donut eating, in our giving, in our committing, in our celebrating, in our listening, the challenge is to share hope. Because we are partakers of the promise of the gospel. My question for you this morning, as we're celebrating are you a hope sharer? Are you a hope sharer? Are you, are, you someone, are you someone that we can look at and say, you know what? They're sharing the hope of Jesus in their life. By the way they live, by the way they celebrate, by the way they serve, by the way they love, Are you a hope sharer? Because that church is the purpose of why Jesus came. To share the hope that we have access to God. And when we were sitting as a leadership and kind of thinking about this growing together thing and what we were doing and the season of what we were doing here and the purpose of all of this, we looked at a lot of different verses and thought, you know, we need to come up, we need, we need to be led to a verse that um, really, really encapsulates what we're doing as a church and where we feel like God has us in a season as a church. And this is the verse we came to. A lot of verses were shared. A lot of verses have been shared over the last six weeks that kind of have, have, have had major impact. But I think this is the one that really kind of skyrocketed to the top. Why? Because this is the mission of the church. May we, never be a, may we never be a body that is so focused on a piece of land or a structure that we miss the gospel and the glory and the reason Jesus came. To give access to Him. May we be a people that never become so inward focused on ourselves and what we're doing and what we've got going on that we forget that 97% of Cumberland County right now is lost without a relationship with Jesus and going to hell if they die. That's our mission. Not given to you by your pastor or a team of elders or Ian or Dylan But in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus speaking, therefore go 
make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. See, God set His church apart with hope and access, peace and unity, forgiveness and reconciliation for His glory, for His kingdom here. That's the work that we get to be a part of. Father, thank you for entrusting us with the truth of your gospel. Thank you that we get to be a part of this. And God, sometimes that can feel overwhelming, but I guess what I feel you calling me to and calling us to is to be faithful in the next step. That we would be faithful in the next conversation to reflect the truth of your gospel, the truth of the good news of your son to the next person we come in contact with, to the next financial decision we make, to the next relationship that we make investment in, to the next place where we challenge someone close to us. Faithfulness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.